Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is David Blight. He is class of 1954 Professor of American History and the director of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at the Macmillan Center. He has written numerous books and articles on race and American history and has been featured in many documentary films about American history on PBS, the BBC, and other networks. Today we'll talk with Professor Blight about his new book, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, which was selected as one of the New York Times Book Review's 10 Best Books of 2018. Welcome, Professor Blight. Thank you, Marilyn. Good to be back with you. Yes, it is a pleasure to have you on again. And um, if I recall, last time you were on, we talked about Slave No More, right. which was born out of um, accounts right. written by two freed slaves. Right. Um, and the uh, and they're rare, uh, mm -hmm. and they were entrusted to you to mm -hmm. um, you know write that book. And yeah, yeah. history seems to be repeating itself because <laughs> here we are with you again today, mm -hmm. and you were given access to new uh, yeah. materials on Fred Frederick Douglass. So um, my question to you is, what was it like to be given, mm -hmm. and especially after study studying Fre Frederick Douglass your whole life, mm -hmm. what was it like for you to get your hands on that material? Uh, extraordinary. And uh, I had put Douglass essentially out of my life uh, by about 10, 12 years ago. I wasn't going to write any more about Douglass. Douglass, well, I wrote my first book on Douglass, but then Douglass had been some part of every other book I had written. A little bit anyway. And then I had the uh, great good luck of encountering a collector, on a, a collector extraordinaire who lives in Savannah, Georgia. His name is Walter Evans. He is an African-American retired surgeon who grew up in segregated Savannah, but he went north for his higher education, did his medical school at Michigan, and practiced for 35 years or so in Detroit. But his real passion in life, uh, and he started his collecting in the 1970s and, and early 80s, uh, is collecting African-American art, rare books, and manuscripts. And I went to Savannah to give a talk to high school teachers, which I've done many times, about Douglas. And my host, which was the Georgia Historical Society, said, there's a local gentleman here. He's a collector. He'd like to meet you. And I said, fine. That day I met Walter. And uh, Walter's collection is the essential reason I wrote this new biography. Mm -hmm. I didn't commit immediately uh, because it was a daunting task. I didn't know if I wanted to take this on. But that collection especially opened up the last third of Frederick Douglass's life. Uh, he's only in his 40s when the Civil War occurs and the Emancipation comes. But Douglass lived 30 more years to 1895 and uh, lived out in a, a remarkable and complicated both public and family life. Mm -hmm. The core of the Evans collection are about 10 very large family scrapbooks that were kept by his sons. Mm -hmm plus a lot of family letters and other kinds of family legal documents and photographs. So that collection gave me a window like we had never had into the older Douglas, the aging Douglas, the Douglas uh, who becomes the patriarch of a huge extended family, but also the Douglas who becomes a kind of political insider mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. and within the 19th century Republican Party. Um, so it, it, was, it was access to a third of Douglas's life we had never seen before. Right. And that collection really is the reason I wrote the new biography. And I was able to employ, I hope, a lot of new insights about uh, Douglas, particularly that latter part of his life. Mm -hmm. And it's why I dedicated the book to Walter and Linda Evans. Mm -hmm. So any anything that surprised you when you were going through mm. the materials and what? Oh gosh, many, many things. Okay. But for example, uh, in these scrapbooks, uh, <laughs> suddenly I happened upon two handwritten narratives. They're fairly short, dozen pages maybe, by two of Douglas's three surviving sons entitled Growing Up in the Douglas Household. 
that kind of revealing access to the memories of his children are extraordinary. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, the scrapbooks are full of literally thousands of newspaper clippings from all kinds of small town newspapers mm -hmm. where Douglas traveled to lecture. The family hired by the 1880s a clipping service, which I didn't even know existed in the wow. 19th century. It was yeah. called the American Bureau. And these clippings would come back labeled American Bureau from all kinds of small town newspapers. And that's because Douglas did ubiquitous speaking tours every year, mm -hmm. all through the end of his life, in part to raise money to finance this very large extended family. He had four surviving adult children, 21 grandchildren, wow. at least three fictive siblings who adopted him or he adopted them, and there were always another variety of hangers-on around Douglas. But I also learned a great deal about Douglas's political public life mm -hmm. in Washington, within the government, apart from the government, the scrapbooks and the Evans collection also gave me access to, insights into a whole variety of rivalries that Douglas had mm -hmm. with other black leaders from the next generation who were doing what the next generation almost always does, which was to try to knock off the great leader. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just this endless array of um, anecdotes and uh, parts of his aging life that allowed me to narrate that part of his life uh, in ways no one had before. And in some ways, the older Douglas took over the story for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I still do the entire life, mm -hmm. including the younger, heroic Douglas. Um, but there's so many anecdotes I learned. For example... Yes, let's, let's have some anecdotes. Well, gosh, when Douglas, uh, when Douglas's wife died, uh, his wife of 44 years, Anna Murray Douglas, died in 1882. Uh, he came apart, and I, I learned this from some letters in that collection and from some newspaper clippings. He even uh, he went up to uh, Poland Springs in Maine, for example, for about a month and a half, all by himself, just as a retreat. But happily, he wrote some letters to his daughter and his sons, which are very revealing about just what it meant that their mother had died. But then he quickly remarried. He, well, in a year and a half, he remarried a woman named Helen Pitts, who was a white woman, 20 years younger, very well educated, and Anna, his first wife, had not been educated. In mm -hmm. fact, had remained largely illiterate all of her life. Helen Pitts, however, was a Mount Holyoke graduate, came from an anti-slavery family, had good abolitionist credentials. She had worked in refugee slave, slave refugee camps during the Civil War. She was very well read. But she was about the age of Douglas's daughter, mm -hmm. Rosetta, his oldest child. And she was working in the Recorder of Deeds office, where Douglas was the Recorder of Deeds. Uh, she was one of the eight clerks he had hired there. Four of them were his four children, and one was Helen Pitts, and uh, from the press accounts and other kinds of documents, mm -hmm. I learned that uh, he and Helen had decided to get married, but they kept it a total secret, even from his children, mm -hmm. or especially from his children. And they got married in secret one afternoon in the parlor of a black minister. Now, what year was this? 1884. Okay. So it's about a year and a half after his wife Anna had died. Okay. They get married one afternoon and a, uh, uh, a newspaper reporter walked into the Recorder of Deeds office in late afternoon and said to Rosetta, the daughter who was working there, did you realize your father just bought a marriage license up the hall here? Because it's in City Hall. And that's how she found out. Now that exploded in the press because the most famous African-American man in the country, if not the world, I just married a white woman mm -hmm. in the 1880s. There must have been tremendous fallout from that. Tremendous fallout. And the, and the Evans collection has a giant collection of press coverage uh -huh. of this. You can find that in the regular press, but I had it all there. In fact, an entire scrapbook is consumed. <laughs> the sons kept all these clippings. Mm -hmm. Now, 
without going into it all, it was a huge scandal. This is the 1880s, not the 1980s. Right. The most famous black man in the country married a white woman 20 years younger. He got pilloried from the black press, the sure. white press, although he got defended as well. He was defended by many of his friends. His children, however, did not take easily to it. It was a very complicated, difficult part of his story. Mm -hmm. They never warmed up to Helen, uh, to put it nicely, mm -hmm. although they said all the right things to the press. So this collection opened up that story to me, mm -hmm. uh, which could have been an entire chapter of the book. I make it a part of a chapter. It's those sorts of elements of Douglas's life. I could go on about this. There's the case where his son-in-law, Rosetta's husband, who was not a good husband, I'll leave it there, mm -hmm. but at one point he sued Douglas. His own son-in-law sued him. That's exploded in the press. Uh, and Douglas had to settle out of court with his own son-in-law. Mm -hmm. This sort of stuff led me to uh, actually used the label in the book that Douglas's family, his extended family, became in effect the black first family mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. Everything they did, good, bad, ugly, got into the press. Mm -hmm. If there was a bankruptcy for one of the sons, it's in the press. He gets sued, it's in the press. He gets, he gets accused of nepotism for hiring his four children as his clerks, which it was. Mm -hmm. And at one point he basically, <laughs> he said, sure, okay, it's nepotism, but my kids need jobs. You know, um, anyway, it, it allowed me, for a biographer, what the Evans Collection allowed me was texture. Mm -hmm. It gives you anecdotal stories that you can begin to piece together to show the nature of a life. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, every day of our lives, we live a partly public life and a partly private life. Sure. And if you're doing biography, you do both. You have to do both. Mm -hmm. And virtually nothing is off limits in biography because you're trying to get a sense of the person. The Evans Collection got me into family life, private life, and not just, you know, this anything salacious. I'm talking about how life was actually lived for this aging federal bureaucrat who mm -hmm. also is the most famous abolitionist in the country, who is this heroic, symbolic figure always associated with slavery and emancipation and the victory of the Civil War, who's always associated with being you know, the head of his race, people would even write to him. Mm -hmm. Black people would write to him and say, dear chieftain of the race. Wow. They wouldn't even say, dear Mr. Douglas. He, he lived with this kind of, well, we would call it celebrity today. They didn't use that term. Mm -hmm. They called it fame. He had a serious problem with how to manage fame mm -hmm. and his reputation, and then had the reputation of his whole extended family mm -hmm. because his kids didn't, all succeed. They didn't all do so well. And he's constantly sending them money, constantly helping them out um, in ways that really uh, weighed on him as an individual. Uh, but then there's so many other public events that he gets associated with and gets involved in controversies of all kinds about issues over the Republican Party, issues over the Kansas uh, migration exodus, issues over every election year. And then eventually, uh, he got appointed U.S. Minister to Haiti, which meant ambassador to Haiti in 1889, when he's in his 70s. And that became very controversial uh, because of the kinds of policies, expansions policies, mm -hmm. that he was asked to enforce there. And everything Douglas did in Haiti was all over the press. Mm -hmm. um, so. I won't say I fell in love with the older Douglas, that's not the way to put it at all, but I became deeply fascinated with this latter part of his life where for so many, for so long now, people who've written about Douglas have always been less interested in that. that. This was the aging man who became this representative man, he had a nice big house in Washington, he held these federal appointments, he was always off lecturing, yeah, okay. And that was never as interesting as the young, heroic, escaped slave mm -hmm. who becomes the great orator, the great abolitionist, uh, the, the fierce critic of Lincoln until he supported Lincoln, the fierce proponent of uh, 
of the Union war effort and the Civil War and of emancipation. And then we just sort of left Douglas behind and forgot about the whole last third of his life. Mm -hmm. No, Douglas is just as interesting as this complicated aging man who never stopped going on the road, taking a speech on the road, trying to influence and persuade people whether the question was racism, terrorism, violence, the right to vote, women's rights, you name it. He is still, and eventually, his last great subject, uh, the last great speech of his life, which he first gives in 1893 and took it on the road all through 1894, right up until about two months before he died, was a speech about lynching called Lessons of the Hour. Uh, he wrote as, uh, as good a careful analysis of why lynching was happening in the 1890s as anyone else did. So he's, he's always out there as the voice, mm -hmm. the, the master of words and language that he had always been. And the Evans Collection allowed me the texture to develop that part of his life mm -hmm. instead of just the early part. Right. So which do you think was easier for you as a biographer, the first part of his life or this part of his life, especially since, as you note, know, mm -hmm. not many people mm -hmm. knew about that part of his life, yeah. just simply because there weren't enough materials, I think, mm -hmm. available. Well, truth is, I didn't find any of it easier. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> because biography always feels like it's infinite. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, there's always something else you can find. Right. I mean, think of somebody who's doing the, the history of your life, or my life, or anyone's life. There's you a lot question, they don't know. Right, and you question if you're getting it right. Exactly, yeah. getting it right or even getting it. Mm -hmm. D do I know enough about this? Can I say anything about this because I don't have the evidence sure. and so on. Um, writing the, uh, the chapters of the young Douglas, the slave Douglas, he's a slave the first 20 years of his life, mm -hmm. and he wrote brilliantly about that in three autobiographies, especially the first two, so he is kind of his own guide for a lot of that, although you've got to penetrate that, too, with some skepticism. Writing those chapters was a bit quicker, in part because the source material is so much more contained. Mm -hmm. The older he gets, the more letters there are, the more, the more speeches there are, the more complications there are in his life. Uh, the children are growing up, they're adults. He has, he has lots of friendships and relationships, some of which you know, are pretty conflicted. Mm -hmm. um, so the older my subject got, the chapters all got longer. That was a problem. Uh, and my editor kept trying to pull me back, pull me back. And as you probably noticed, it's a very long book. 800 pages I, almost. I know. <laughs> and, but you know, people have asked me, <laughs> what is your theory of biography? I don't know that yet I have one. Mm -hmm. Because you're, if I have a theory of biography, it is simply you tell the story as it was lived. You try to get inside of the life and then narrate it as it is lived. Stopping on, and you're making choices all the time, mm -hmm. but stopping on the episodes that are most important and those indeed that you have the most evidence for. And you are narrating, you're telling a story, but you're also trying to recreate a character a personality, a human being. You're trying to help your reader understand how this person lived and thought and behaved, and you got to say it when you think this person didn't behave well or was utterly insensitive to something or worse. Uh, but you just kind of tell it. And what I mean by that is I started out with elaborate outlines. Uh, there was this 22-chapter outline. I just outlined the whole book. And I kept changing it and changing it. And I realized finally, I don't know, somewhere halfway through, I'd just throw out the outline and let the chapters evolve as they do. Now, clearly, I, I would make a plan that this chapter, I'm going to cover these two years of the war, or this chapter, I'm going to cover these three major episodes during Reconstruction. But I kept it always chronological, of course. But also, it's still, Doug, it's what's in front of Douglas, what's, what's what Douglas is living, and then anybody else who has a role in that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there are no real theories of biography. You tell the life as it's happening. Mm 
Now, there are different kinds of biographies. Some biographies are almost entirely public. Mm -hmm. Some biographies are an attempt to tell all, to tell all private life, which you tend to get about novelists and you know poets, mm -hmm. the lives of the poets. Uh, in this case, though, my models for this biography tended to be some of the great literary biographies because Douglas was such a writer. Mm -hmm. He wrote millions of words, 1,200 pages of autobiography, uh, hundreds and hundreds of the short form political editorials in his newspaper, and then thousands of speeches, almost all of which we have a text for. Wow. He wrote them down. So there are millions of words. He's a, he's a word master. He's a creature of language. So I looked to a lot of the at least for me, my favorite literary biographies, because I'm writing about a writer. At the same time, I'm writing about a public figure. Mm -hmm. And some writers are very much public figures. So anyway, uh, I, I guess I'm a biographer now, <laughs> <laughs> whether I wanted to be or not. Okay. But it's, uh, sometimes it kind of defines itself as you go. Sure, sure. Um, I am wondering, you know, in your first book, Douglas sets out as this radical outsider, okay? Yeah, Just, yeah. Um, you know, freed from slavery, mm -hmm. um, radical outsider, and then over the course of his life becomes really a political insider, and as right. you noted, mm -hmm. you know, was made the ambassador to Haiti. So sure. explain how that process happened. Wow, it is one of the most important trajectories of his life, and, and fascinating trajectories. You know, what happens to the old... <clears throat> radical outsider, always outside of power, knocking on the doors, always demanding the country live up to its creeds, and a ferocious radical critic. <laughs> That's what abolitionists were. Right. He experiences the Civil War, uh, where he was also a radical critic, uh, and then he reaps victory in the middle of life. He's only in his 40s, and his cause won. How many radicals actually win mm -hmm. in their lifetime? And then he uh, has to find new roles, new, new functions. And he worried, he worried greatly there at the end of the war. What do I do now? You know, in fact, when he wrote about the end of the war in 1865-66 in his last autobiography, he called that chapter Vast Changes. And he opened in the first paragraph of it with the famous line from Shakespeare's Othello. He said, Othello's occupation is gone. I am without my community, without my church. And in Othello, it's Othello uh, expressing the great anxiety that he's lost his army, he's lost his status, he's lost everything. Othello didn't yet know he's about to lose his wife and even kill his wife, but that, you know, horrible tragedy. But Douglas employs that moment in Othello when just loss of all meaning and status. Well, it turns out he hadn't lost his status at all. He was suddenly under constant demand as a speaker, and he became a real participant in, in Reconstruction, although he was always frustrated that he couldn't affect policy as much. But where Douglas found his role is where it had always been, his voice, his oratorical voice, mm -hmm and his written voice. He found after the war, during Reconstruction, for example, that he now had access to major newspapers and major magazines. Mm -hmm. He's no longer editing his own newspaper, which was always his outlet, his own voice. Sure. Now he could write for the New York Tribune and the North American Review and the Independent, these major sort of progressive journals and magazines. And kind of legitimized him? Oh yeah, it legitimized him. But he was so legitimized as well as an orator. Uh, he's the invited orator at the unveiling of the Freedmen's Memorial, the famous statue of Lincoln standing with the kneeling slave in 1876, where he gave what I think is his second greatest speech, second only to his Fourth of July speech of 1852. And then with time, Douglas is constantly, constantly pressed and invited to express what does he think about this, what does he think about that. Then the Republican Party finally embraces him and sends him out on the stump every presidential election okay. year. Douglas campaigned for every Republican president from Grant to the end mm -hmm. in the 1890s. Uh, 
Not always with a great deal of uh, glee. Uh, he wasn't always happy with what was happening to the Republican Party as it moved away from black civil and political rights and more toward big business. Mm -hmm and was paying less attention by the 18, far less attention by the 1880s to the crisis in the South. Uh, but he found his role with his voice. Uh, it was always essentially the only weapon Douglas ever had mm -hmm. was his pen and his voice. Right. And he understood that. He also created a new newspaper for a while, for three years. He and his sons edited a new a paper, 1870, 1873 in Washington called the New National Era. Mm -hmm. his, Douglas, I mean, his sons were the printers and he was the editor. That fell on hard times and he lost about $10,000 on it. And then he got appointed uh, the president of the Freedmen's Bank in 1874, which also failed on his watch. Oh, he admitted boy. he wasn't a banker. It didn't fail because of him. It was already failing when he took it over. Mm -hmm. So there are other, he always called these ventures, you know, that life needs ventures, and he was always taking the next venture. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But the most important venture of his life was always there in words. And by 1881, he writes the third version of his autobiography called Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. And one of the things you have to do if you're his biographer <laughs> When you write a biography of someone who wrote 1,200 pages of autobiography mm -hmm. three times, uh, his own version of his life is always there in front of you. The subject mm -hmm. is in the way because he's, he's already imposing the story on you. And those autobiographies have almost nothing about his family life, his two marriages. Mm -hmm his friendships, relationships, et cetera, et cetera. It's the public, it's the public hero. So you have to find other ways around that. On the other hand, those autobiographies are also not just your source, they're your subject. You have to keep explaining, why did this man believe he had to keep telling his story? Mm -hmm. Is it because he knew he had to be the representative African-American, the former slave who reinvented himself and then reinvented himself again and again in this country that always, always desperately wants to believe that we're reinventing ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, he's kind of the prototype for that. Um, so he finds all kinds of new roles, but almost always it's connected to language and words. Even after he got a salary for the first time in his life as Marshal of the District of Columbia and Recorder of Deeds in the District of Columbia, federal appointments. Those brought him a salary, but he still spent half of his life out on the road giving speeches and writing new speeches and writing columns and editorials for all sorts of places when he was asked. Down to the end of his life, uh, at age 77, uh, he is still well, at least, at least while he was 76, he is still out there. And this is something I learned about Douglas. You know, when, when you write biography, you spend a lot of time with this person. There are times when you don't think you know them at all. You just, it's just so elusive. Mm -hmm. And then there are times when you think, oh, this I know. But one of the things I know, a couple things. Douglas had no formal education. He spent 20 years as a slave, never a day in his life in a schoolroom. He was a sponge. If he met you, he would figure out what he can learn from you. Mm -hmm. He had no other teachers. The world was his teacher. The people he met were his teachers. He'd learn what he could learn from you, and then he might just discard you, go on to the next person he can learn from. Mm -hmm. That's the way he was. And that didn't always lend itself to long-lasting friendships. Sure. The second thing I think I do know about Douglas is he's one of those people, like a, maybe a lot of us, who didn't know what he thought about something until he could write it down. Mm -hmm. He was a writer. Big crisis comes up, <clears throat> whether that is the Fugitive Slave Act, Lincoln's election, emancipation, or some crisis in Reconstruction. Whatever comes up, he goes to his desk and he writes a new speech. He did it so many times. And then that speech he takes out on the road where he may give it dozens and dozens of times to huge audiences. And that might be a, a fact worth stating too, although it's not necessarily a fact. I speculate in the book that 
quite likely more Americans heard Frederick Douglass speak than any other American of the 19th century. Wow. I don't think there's anyone to truly compare to him with the possibility, a possible exception at least, of Mark Twain. Douglass gave thousands of speeches. He did lecture trips that were always three and four months long, where he would speak every day or every other day, endlessly throughout his life. Mm -hmm. And it became a kind of a phenomenon for people. Uh, you know, I saw Douglas speak, or going to see Douglas speak. Um, millions. I can't, I, I can never come up with such a number, mm -hmm. but it is just phenomenal how widespread his voice became, primarily because of his own indomitable will uh, to be heard. It is kind of the will to power as the will to speak and the will to write. And he became, I say this in the book, especially at the end, he dealt with every subject there was in the 19th century, but of course his, his, his great subjects were slavery, racism, Emancipation, the Civil War, Reconstruction, what all this meant. These are, the, these are the pivots of American history in the 19th century. And he became in many ways a kind of a prose poet of, of American democracy, of those issues. He dabbled in real poetry, but it really wasn't his best mode. His, his poetry was in his prose. And that's where one finds the, the prophetic voice, and hence my use of the word prophet in the title. He had methods and ways with language that few other Americans have ever had. So what would you like your readers to take away from your book? That Douglas was, for that 19th century, and still is in some ways, the prose poet of what it means to be an American, what it means, what our creeds actually mean, how our creeds had to be literally destroyed and, re and reinvented, how the country, the republic, was crushed in the Civil War and then reinvented out of that war. But I'd also like them to understand his sheer endurance. And by that I mean not his physical endurance, travel and putting up with the hardships and all that, but it was endurance of the problem of racism and white supremacy, how you could continue to face that, argue with it, argue against it day in, day out, when almost, most, almost all of your people are still enslaved and there's very little hope they'll ever be freed in your own lifetime if it's the 1850s mm -hmm. or the 1840s when he's starting out. And how you endure, he, his story of endurance of the racism he himself personally encountered. Early in his career when he would encounter, you know, discrimination, he'd be thrown off a railroad car, he'd be denied a dinner in a hotel, et cetera, et cetera. He would often react with outrage. Mm -hmm. I mean, just sheer anger and rage. As he got older and encountered this, and he kept, he got Jim Crowed more times than anyone could ever mm. count. But as he got older, he would begin to even process it with a certain absurd sense of humor. Because what else can you do? Right. I mean, for example, uh, later in life, he sometimes would still get asked at a hotel or a, you know, a, a guest house to not eat in the dining room with the rest of the white people. Mm -hmm. And there are at least two instances I have in the book. <laughs> he would get up in the middle of the dining room in his loud baritone voice and he'd say, well then where do the dogs eat? Tell me, tell me where your dogs are. Take me where the dogs are. I'll eat with the dogs. And pretty soon he's got the whole dining room on his side. They're saying, oh, don't make that poor man eat with the dogs. And the owner has to sit him, mm -hmm. seat him. Now, you know, that's a kind of a endurance as well, but it shows us, you know, we may see Frederick Douglass as this great orator, this great writer, this great man of the 19th century, but he still had to endure sometimes on a daily basis this kind of hideous individual daily racism. Mm -hmm. And the ways he found to endure that at the same time analyzing it, criticizing it, trying to destroy it, is kind of a central thread of his life. And I want readers to get that, that you don't defeat something like this mm 
by just throwing your body at it. You don't defeat it by sheer outrage alone. You have to feed it. You have to defeat it with, with wit, mm -hmm. and cunning, and probably even a sense of humor. This has been <laughs> such a pleasure, David. Thank you. And just in the interest of time, I, there's so many more questions and yeah, so much we more we could have talked about in your mm -hmm. book. Um, but there's plenty left for readers to uh, read. So hopefully they will do that. So thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. It's a pleasure to be here. For more information about Professor Blight and his work, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank, Thank you. you.